Welcome to another episode of the Underground Bunker Podcast, a very special episode. Uh, this is your proprietor, Tony Ortega. I am joined by Jeff Levin and his brother, Robbie Levin, the Brothers Broken, who uh, you've heard uh, some of their story before. We're going to talk about it tonight, and I'm I'm fortunate to have them because their documentary, Brothers Broken, is showing up in a theater. When, when is that happening, Jeff? We're two... Two screenings in San Jose of the Cinequest Film Festival. The first one is Sunday the 20th at 7.30. No, it's I'm sorry, at 7. Sorry, at 4.30. 4.30 on August 20th. And then we're in Mountain View at the Icon Theater, and that's 11.30 on the 26th. And Mountain View is a really nice theater. That's near San Jose. Yeah. AM 11:30. Man, so, I wish I could be there. Robbie, it's been a long journey to get to this point, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, we started this thing a few years ago and um well, we took our time, went through some changes on it. We uh we got we got the first byproduct of it done about a year and a half ago though because we uh we released that short documentary uh, the story is spinning which is kind of covered in the in the long documentary, but not as long. And, and that documentary, which was 16 minutes, it did extremely well in the, um, you know, the international uh, short film festival circuit. So we're, we've got our fingers crossed and hoping that the, the long documentary will get similar reaction. Well, let me let me make sure the our viewers and listeners know what we're talking about with Brothers Broken with spinning. Uh, just uh, real quick, as I understand it, the two of you were in the band People, which had a huge hit in 1968, and then almost immediately you joined the Sea Org in Scientology, and kind of uh, it kind of like uh, short circuited this amazing musical career you had. Put everything into the Sea Org, kind of split up the band a little bit. You dedicated yourselves to L. Ron Hubbard and Scientology, and then eventually. Robbie, you left first, and Jeff, you stayed dedicated, and that, you know, because of Scientology, it ripped the two of you apart, and you didn't communicate for many years, and this film is about how Jeff kind of hits rock bottom, really difficult times, the underground bunker has a, has a cameo, and then uh, you start coming out, and you guys are reunited, and the band gets back together, wonderful story. Along the way, we learn that Robbie Levin is a fantastic cyclist and he actually invented the sport of spinning and was not getting credit for it. And so uh, I know your son is in it. It's a really great short film where you explain that back in the eighties, I guess it was, you came up with the idea of designing an exercise routine around riding an exercise bike to music and that you really were the person that came up with that, that later became this gigantic craze. Have I described things basically correct? Yes, and so. and uh, the the spinning story, because it was important to get it out there. I really felt it was really important because Robbie never got the credit. I did a lot of research, and I ended up being the co-director on that short film. And I felt this was a great way to learn about documentaries because I'd never directed a doc documentary before, and so. It was great working with Tim Jansen, who's my editor, and and I learned more about spinning and learned more about Robbie <laughs> from doing the research. And I'm somewhat of an activist, and I just was so pissed off when I went to Wikipedia and Robbie's name is not even on Wikipedia in the spinning. And um, so I want to, I still want to see the spinning film get out and be seen by all people who are enthusiasts, cyclists, and who are into spinning, the the health uh, thing of spinning. Well, so, yeah, don't well, get... And, and, and you know, there's a, there's a lot of things in history that are not documented properly. I mean, we all know that L. Ron Hubbard was Buddha, <laughs> and he gets no credit for that. <laughs> That's all. true. He absolutely gets no credit. He's not even... Well, he, he did get a little credit because they wrote a whole huge epic music thing about him being buddha a huge thing so were you involved in that jeff see i don't know if everybody understands that not only were the both of you are, are both of you musicians and uh you were in this band then and this band now but jeff you were you were deeply involved in many of the music projects that scientology put 
put out in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, right? Well, I realized just a, a day, I just made a comment on on your um, Substack regarding that, that I, I did three pieces of music that were iconic for Scientology. And one was the co-written Dianetics commercial, which I did with Chris Maney, Nancy Maney's ex-husband. And uh, the second one was the theme for the Scientology intro movie. Orientation? The orientation film. Wow. The theme was written by Chris and I. We produced it. Wow. Now, but here's the great part. And this is where you were talking about Hubbard. And this was about copywriting. They took that theme and stole it. Mm. They, they literally ripped it off. And so anyway, I had to go in and say, dudes, I'm, I'm okay with this, but you got to license it. So, so they did. And then the third one was United, which was the first time they did a social media video that actually impinged on the general public. If you remember United. All right. The, well, the it, youth, it, for, youth for whom human rights. Okay. But if you just written "We Stand Tall," then then they'd have to give you a Grammy or something because that's that's the uh, that's the one everyone remembers. But yeah, no, that's huge that you <laughs> that you that you wrote the music to the Dianetics famous Dianetics commercial that sold millions of Dianetics books in the eighties, and uh, and the orientation film. Wow, that's that's amazing, Robbie. You you uh, did amazing things outside of Scientology. I you know I've seen I've been fortunate to see multiple versions of your documentary and some things have kind of come and some things have kind of gone. I, I don't know that it's in the present um, copy that the public is going to see, but at least one version I saw went into this incredible career you had after Scientology in fashion. Yeah, I did. I um, <clears throat> had a design manufacturing company in, in uh, Los Angeles uh, that I did for 18 years. And we, we started in a garage with just myself and my partner, just the two of us, we were doing custom airbrush t-shirts and we developed it into a design company. Um, when I left 18 years later, we were doing $150 million a year. And uh, we, I think we were the seventh largest clothing manufacturer on the West Coast. And wow. we sold to every major retailer in the country, everybody, no exceptions. So, you know, Jeff Levin is, uh, you know, this major musical figure in Scientology. Robbie Levin's this major fashion guy and invented spinning. But Scientology somehow convinced you guys or, or forced you guys to stay apart for how long? 28 years. 28 years. Yeah. And it, the story. Go ahead, Jeff. Sorry. Well, I, 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 really. In a, I uh, didn't want to see that happen. Robbie and I were getting along really well. I did sense, though, that he wasn't dedicated. He was, you know, more into his company, but he was supportive. And so, anyway, it, it got got worse and worse. He started. He worked with a, a gal that's in the movie, Vicky Lewis. At the time, her name was Vicki Lewis. And, and uh, he just knew many things about Scientology that I had no clue, and I didn't want to know. Mm -hmm. So in 84, the confrontation happened. He sat me down, and he should tell the David Miscavige story. I yeah, think. tell me the but, David Miscavige story, Robbie. But anyway, he sat me down, and it was like, okay, we're done. Wow. You know, and, and that was my decision, not his. Is like I can't be around you anymore. Wow. I I kind of went um, a little rogue in 1972. We got in in '68, and after four years of you know studying and, and doing a lot of courses, the training, getting all, all the, the auditing as far up as you could go on the um, on the grade chart, which was OT6 at that time, um, and and then I really got turned off to the organization for a lot of good reasons. But I just buried myself in my music with my band, um, Rocking Horse, and then uh, the clothing company. And then 
after after Rocking Horse broke up, which was pretty much because I was so busy with the clothing company, I, I then played bass with Rick Springfield for two and a half years and toured with him. Um, but what happened was in 1980, about eight years after I had been doing no auditing, no training, nothing, I decided to go back to uh, Clearwater and do some advanced courses that had come out in that eight year period, um, still believing in quote, the quote unquote technology and still believing in Hubbard, but knowing that the organization was screwed up. And uh, in a nutshell, I walked in there and I, I saw a whole different organization than I had seen in 1972. It was so amateurish, it was so stupid. They're lying through their teeth about everything. And, and Hubbard was talking about things that I had some knowledge on. I, and we talk about this in the documentary and he was just totally full of shit. Sorry, if, if it's okay to, to say hey, Of that. course, of course. You know, he was so full of it. So I, in 1980, I came back to LA and I started doing some research on him. And, uh, and also that was the time when they started chopping off the heads of all the mission holders and right. they started kicking people out of Scientology. And, and there was a friend of mine, uh, Martin Samuels, who they destroyed his life. I mean, completely destroyed his life, which really pissed me off. And so um, I I knew about Miscavige, but you know, this is like 1982 or three now, and I'm under the radar and I'm not telling people I'm out of Scientology, but I, I decided to have a party just so I could meet Miscavige. Oh, really? I threw a big party at my house and it was actually myself and this actress who I was living with, Joni Prather, and we co-did the party with Jeffrey Lewis, who's one of Jeff's best friends. And so we did this party together and we invited all the actors and actresses in Scientology and all the musicians. And, you know, Chick Corea was there and Stanley Clark was there and Mike Garson was there and Jeff's, Jeff's group was there. And there were all these great musicians. They're all jamming downstairs at my house. And then they had all these actors and actresses and i knew that if i did that miscavige would come mm. miscavige came to the party and i went into the back room with him and it was just it was uh what was his name jeff Shar sharkey um, oh norman Star starkey. norman starkey right yeah norman starkey and david miscavige the three of us and i had all these questions that, that i was going to give him and i knew all the answers to the questions and they were kind of i was trying to keep it uh, you know, politically correct. So he didn't think I was antagonistic. And I just asked him all these questions very innocently. And he just lied through his teeth on every single thing, which was was pretty hilarious. And I didn't say anything. And I just went about my business. But I, I wanted to see him, you know, face to face for myself. And he's and just such a, he's Robbie, such a punk. He's such a punk. Ro Robbie, how tall are you? Uh, 5'11". So he, he's like, he's like, yeah, we are. Uh, he's yeah, but you know, I wasn't paying attention to his height. Okay, you know, I was paying attention to what a punk he was. I mean, just a little cocky, arrogant, uh, and he's a coward. He's a total coward. So wow, what a party! And and Joan Prather, she's the one that got Travolta in. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And I lived with her for for five years. I lived with her. Wow. I just wanted to add a little something. Robbie picked the exact right time to throw that party because remember Miscavige was new to everybody yeah and, and the, the other executives were kind of known but this was a new team so they wanted to be there because they wanted to meet all the celebrities so it was an ideal time they were like yeah we're we're coming for sure maybe so. the only time that that could have happened and you this would have been like 83 or so something like that it was 83, wasn't it jeff I think yeah it was. i think it was late 83 it was before i got aggressive with the church and right told them i wanted my money back for my uh, services that i hadn't used and things like that and before i did the article with the clearwater sun that said i was leaving scientology because i couldn't condone their criminal activities it was before all that happened. Yeah, so it was it was after 80 when Hubbard went into seclusion. It was after 82 when Miscavige then led the team that decimated the mission holders in San Francisco. Yes. But before Hubbard died and Miscavige really took over. And so he so that just that brief time when Miscavige was kind of amassing uh power, 
but he wasn't the power yet. And so he might just show up to hang out with celebrities and stuff. That's, yeah. that's amazing. That's just incredible. Yeah. And I did the party just for that reason. And, uh, and Joni didn't even, I didn't even discuss it with Jeff Lewis, of course, cause he was deeply in and I didn't discuss it with Joni. I just, well, let's have this, let's have a party for all the celebrities in Scientology. And it was, it was wow. a really fun party too. It was a great, great party. A lot of live music at that party. Yeah, there was. I mean, uh, were you there, Jeff, at that time? Oh, I, I would. I wouldn't have missed it. Except, <laughs> I was like, "Whoa, Miss Scavage is going to be there." And yeah, Jeff I, played with. Um, Jeff did a whole set with Larry McNeely. Yeah, with the banjo player Larry Larry McNeely, and then Jeffrey Lewis and I. I think we did one story. Okay. Uh, from Celestial Navigations, right? And then, and and there was yeah, it was. I think it, all the good musicians were there, right, Robbie? Oh yeah, every 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 all, everybody was there. The, the jamming went on for about an hour and a half, two hours downstairs. Yeah, it was it was an interesting time in Scientology, and of course, Tony, you're aware that you know around in 1980 when Kimma Douglas, uh, who was Hubbard's nurse for nine years, when she blew the Sea Org and escaped. She came to my house and stayed with me. She came directly from over the rainbow, wherever they were in Hammett. And she came directly to my house and stayed with me for two weeks, um, which was really the, the thing that, the straw that broke the camel's back for me because that the debriefing and her telling me all the insanity and how crazy Hubbard was, was, was uh, you know, more information than, than I had really ever expected to get anywhere else. It was pretty amazing to get yeah she had taken care of him on the apollo when he had all of his health problems and everything i mean she knew his real situation about as well as anybody in the world probably better than anybody in the world yeah she had to go pick up his meds you know when he right would, he would fill out those scripts that dr dank signed just dr dank just gave him a, a stack of scripts blank scripts and hubbard hubbard would fill them out and kim would have to go and pick up the the drugs. Wow. You know, he was experimenting with drugs so much. Mm. Yeah. So Kima, Kima was... We don't take drugs in Scientology. That's right. That's true. We do not. I was going to say just a little bit, Kima and Robbie and I were all really good friends early on in the 60s, right? I mean, 68. <clears throat> and then I, when I went on the ship, she was one of the mother hens that helped me. And boy, that was a whole scary thing when I was on the ship. Anyway, she's a great, great gal and amazing that she hung in there as long as she did. Yeah, amazing person. So what is it you think that Scientology, what's, what power do they have? What methods do they have that they could keep two such talented you know, formerly close brothers apart from each other for 28 years. How do they pull that off? Well, you know, the suppressive person policy. And, and, and I got declared, once I did that article with the Clearwater Sun, I was immediately declared. Back then, they actually put out the goldenrod and you could actually see the declaration. And uh, Jeff, Jeff, I don't, I'm, I, can't, I can't really speak for Jeff, but from what we've discussed, he didn't want to disconnect for me. He just, he wanted me to, you know, be in good standings. But when you're declared, you either disconnect from the person or you get declared. And how does that work, Jeff? How, how is that? I mean, you know, I think a lot of people who are never in Scientology say to themselves, they could never keep me from my brother or my mother or by my father. How, how do they manage to convince you that it's better to stay loyal to the church and turn your brother away. How do, how do they pull that off, Jeff? Well, if they didn't have to convince me, I embraced Hubbard's dogma. The first dogma is we're immortal, which I, I still believe, but not the way Scientology lays it out. So I wanted to maintain my immortality and my ability to remember past lives and everything and the second thing of dogma is families are not really important, no matter what they say. 
Hubbard says, oh, this this brief little time that you're with your brother, it's just like a, a, a millisecond. So who cares? Yeah, right? right. He's just right. another guy in your family. And then um, thirdly, he he was portrayed as a dangerous person. He fit at the time he fit my view of what an antisocial personality was. So yeah. and, and if you looked at the attributes, I could go, yeah, he did that. Yeah, he did that. So but nobody convinced me. And that's the, that's what's so uh, persistent about it is you're already a believer. So yeah, as I like to say, uh, sorry to interrupt, but as I like to no, say, that's okay. Scientology does not endorse alcohol, but that's because the Kool Aid's a thousand proof. <laughs> <laughs> I just made that up on the spot. But, yeah. <laughs> that's great. Uh, so, Robbie, um, what was, you know, tell me what it was like. I mean, did you have no, during those years, you're doing the clothing uh you're venting spinning uh you you've you're, you've got a family you've got kids um during that time were you even hearing anything about jeff i mean you weren't talking to him but were you getting any reports from anybody in scientology um not no not really i really wasn't. um and, um i would you know frequently once the internet came came into existence it was a little easier to check out his progress and what he was doing musically um you know I, I knew that until he got out that there wasn't going to be any communication um and you know it wasn't until 2007 when we did the uh, induction into the San Jose Rocks Hall of Fame that I actually talked to him for the first time but of course that was brief that only lasted about six or seven months um you know because I I had to pretend that I wanted to come in back into Scientology for them to uh, approve communicating for that concert that we did, the live show we did. And uh, and that was kind of fun because uh, I got to con them for a change rather than them. So, me. and what was the event again? It was uh, Hall of Fa San Jose Hall of Fame? Yeah. It's called San Jose Rocks. And it's like the San Jose Hall of Fame produced by a man named Dan Orloff. And then you have other people who were inducted like Creedence Clearwater, Jefferson Airplane, all these local Bay Area bands. So it was a kind of a high profile thing. And uh, and then yeah, Robbie yeah. can tell you more we, of the story we, about what he had to do. Yeah, what'd you have to do, Robbie? Well, we were supposed to, we were supposed to perform at it. It was the second year. And of course, Albert, the Albert Rubisi, the keyboard players who's still in Scientology, and Jeff were still in. The other members were out, but I was the only one that was declared. Okay. And, and so, um, <clears throat> so what I did is I contacted the Chief Justice um, or IJC, International Chief Justice in Scientology, and I said, you know, I've been thinking about it for a while. I'd like to get back into good standings. And you know, we have this concert coming up, and we can't perform at this concert. So the band won't even be able to perform. And Larry, who is the, one of the main lead singer characters, he said, if Robbie's not there because of the Scientology thing, he says, I'm not coming either. Mm. Right. So so and I let them know that I let the church know that. And I said, you know, what do I have to do? And of course, you know, you've heard of uh, what is it? A to C. A to E steps. A to, a to, e. A to, e to get back in good standings. I couldn't get all that done within a short period of time because we had to start rehearsing and stuff. So they let me shortcut it. And I, I did a little amends project and I gave him some money and I bought a ton of books and, <laughs> and I spent some money and, and they, well, and that was 2007. So they were selling the basics then. So we're like, did you have to buy a set of basics or something to make I them happy? I, bought, I think I bought, I don't know. I bought a few sets of basics. <laughs> I think the basics were like $3,000 each. Yes, 3000 each I, set. I think I, bought, I think I bought three of them. Oh, God. And then and then, and then, then once I got them, I threw them in our fire pit at the, at the resort. <laughs> the resort, we had a great fire pit at the resort. Anyway, um, so they allowed us to do that. We rehearsed and played. And, and I obviously had no intention of doing my ADE steps. I did, you know, I did the first couple of steps just, just to 
get started. And uh, after, uh, I think it was by, th this was in October that we performed. So I think it was June or July of 2007 that I, um, <clears throat> that I initiated getting back into good standing and they let us rehearse. And then um, the event was in October. And then by May, they had been bugging me to continue my steps. And I just, you know, I just kept putting them off. It's like, oh yeah, I just, I just sold my resort and, you know, I'm busy. And then they finally gave up on me and they told Jeff, well, you got to disconnect from him again. What did you think at that time, Jeff? What did you think about you? What was it like? First of all, what was it like for you suddenly to be performing with your brother again, knowing that he had been declared and all that? Well, it, Albert and I really were in touch about this, this whole issue when it came up. And, and we were both actually happy to see that Robbie was going to do something about it, and and he was fairly convincing. Although there's a little part of me that was going, I don't know about this. Let's <laughs> see if he follows through. But I didn't care, right? Right. right. Because we we're back together. It was a wonderful experience for the whole band to be together. And Larry Norman died a few months after that mm, event. Right. So it was great to be there together and um i i wanted it to happen and i think what did happen is when i saw this wasn't going to happen and they were saying and i i saw it and i was at the advanced organization doing upper level auditing okay their therapy and they just said this is not going to work you if you want to continue your auditing you need to disconnect from your brother Again, basically. yeah. Well, only this time it hit me harder. I think. Ah, uh, uh huh. So wow. Hmm. That was that wasn't my intention. But obviously, I just wanted the band to be able to perform together. But <clears throat> it was unfortunate what happened afterwards. Um, yeah. So another uh, ten years, something like that, that uh, you guys were apart. No, it was it was well, a little well, bit shorter than that. Right. But there's, there's there's spoiler alerts in there, which we we don't want to get into too much. Right, but, okay. Yeah, we'll save that for the film. But 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 yeah, it, it did cause a serious mental problem for me. And, and at that point, Robbie was helpless to do anything about it. So he can talk about that I mean, a little bit. Well, did you know that Jeff was having such terrible trouble during that ensuing period, Robbie? Yeah, I got, I, I can't remember who I got the feedback from. Uh, it might have been, might have been, no, I think it might have been Ed Berwick, I think. Who was yeah, a, Ed, probably. Ed, who's a, you know, was one of my best friends in, in high school who was, uh, you know, left Scientology, but never got declared. And so he was able to stay in touch with always stay in touch with Jeff and friends of Jeff's. Okay. Yeah. And what and, were you? And, oh, and then I, and then I called, and then I talked to his partner, Bruce, who's a non-Scientologist and Jeff's partner. The and business partner, the musician. Uh... They had the he, He's an engineer, composer, co-composer. We've been together for 30 years or something. Okay. And so Bruce and I were having conversations, which was much more informative because Bruce was so close to him. Right. Um, and then I asked, then, then I had asked Denny and Jean, who were in LA together, to go visit Jeff. And that's covered in the documentary as well. But uh, that's the right. drummer, the singer, and they went over to Jeff's house and, and you know, saw him <clears throat> in his, uh, you know, near death state, emaciated, mm. malnutrition. And, and well, then comes such an exciting change but i don't know jeff if you want to have people wait till they get to the theater to hear about it but uh no because it, it's so much so involves you too <laughs> and then and, and, and it also involves which is interesting uh leah remini uh-huh how but, i don't remember that part of it well what i remember is there was something that she did that was in google news i used to my world was the size of a little teeny cell phone. 
that was it. I would, but I'd read the news and something came up on Scientology and Leah Remney and it led to your, to the Village Voice. Oh, okay, okay. It led to you and I read it and your reporting of it was so clear and you were so spot on because I knew so much information right. about Scientology. And I got hooked. This was September of 2011. Uh, two months. Okay. So two months of of intermittent doses of Tony Ortega. And I woke up one day, and this this is in the movie, but I think it's it's more, you know, who cares? I mean, it's it's different when you see it in the movie. I woke up one day and I knew I was out of Scientology. And I knew that the reason I, I had the issues was Scientology. But Tony, do you remember that you and I had a discussion before you knew Jeff was out? We were talk we talked about it. You had interviewed me on the phone. You remember that? I remember we talked and uh was it initially about Kima that you and I were for first yes. talking? Yeah, but but Jeff okay. didn't want, Jeff didn't want anybody to know oh. he was under the radar. So I didn't tell you. Okay. I, I, if you remember, I didn't tell you that he was out. You, right. As far as you knew, he was still in because he didn't want to expose it to anybody. And I don't think you found out until that night uh, at Sundance after going clear when we were at the after that little after party at Spanky Taylor's room. And, and Jeff, I was on the phone with Jeff and he said, let me talk to Tony and Mike Rinder. Do you remember that? And you found out that he was out. And oh, I told you he was Bob. I yes, was that's what it was. Yeah. So so I was I communicating with Bob before I knew who Bob was? Is yeah. that how it worked? Yeah, yeah. I think so. I think so. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you were. You, you, and you I, could, liked... I couldn't tell you because he didn't want anybody to know. Wow. Yeah. And that was that was uh what, 10, eleven years ago. Yeah. uh well the night the, the oh, night no, of going clear was later yeah going cl going clear was uh eight years ago yeah but he be he went under the radar officially right right yeah so uh and then i left the voice in 2012 and started up this uh my current bunker in september 2012 and then I don't know when it was. I, you know, I should go back and try to make notes of all this, Jeff. I'm sorry I haven't. But at some point, I started, I started hearing from this guy Bob, and uh, I think that was twelve. I think that was twenty twelve. Yeah, it was twelve. Yeah, yeah. and uh, really interesting. I mean, this person really knew his stuff, and but you know, wanted to stay completely secret and all that. Uh, and we talk about this in the movie, but at some point, then Bob pops up in the bunker itself. <laughs> I got really nervous for you. I was like, wait a minute, dude, somebody's going to recognize you. But uh, yeah, just wonderful. Uh, I mean, you know, from my perspective, I had a new source. I had somebody that was helping me understand things who really clearly knew the Celebrity Center. And but, you know, I think it was only later when I started talking to both of you about your story that I realized how much that meant to you, Jeff. To have that connection, to to be able to speak to somebody about what they had been through, um, and it just blew me away once I started hearing about what the two of you had actually been through. It's just incredible. Yeah, by normal standards, it's pretty pretty wild. Well, uh, yeah, and uh, Jeff, you've just become a beloved member of the bunker, and I'm so glad you're in there practically every day uh, helping us understand things and definitely helping me understand a lot. I mean, you you were a fixture at the Celebrity Center, and you saw a lot of these celebrities come and go. What do you, what do you, you know, I always get asked this. What is the appeal for sci for celebrities and why is Scientology so obsessed with celebrities? What do you tell people when you get those questions? Well, the obsession part comes from Hubbard. He he had the, the opinion leader policy. He was bright enough to see, okay, how how are people doing publicity? How are they getting advertisement that people will instantly believe? And it's with the opinion leader. 
and many of the opinion leaders are, are the actors and the music people. And so that was it. There, and, and Robbie and I were right at the beginning before Celebrity Center with Yvonne Gillum talking about, wouldn't it be great, Yvonne, if you formed an organization just for celebrities? I mean, we were, I remember the three of us sitting there, right, Robbie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 we were. Yeah, it, that was the inspiration because we were, we had joined the Sea Org in, 19, in June of 1969. We had signed our billion year contracts and went and did our, our training on a couple of the ships and uh, our mission, it was called Project People, was the mission. And we were, um, there was, um, we were, um, I think I might have sent you some of this stuff, Tony. We were among the first six staff of Celebrity Center. Wow. We were part of Celebrity Center. And, and I got, that's why I had those copies of the orders of the day. Um, and it talked about who was on staff. And, and, uh, and so we were there right at the inception. Uh, and that and that was kind of the um, I, I think the the seed because Yvonne was running the advanced organization. Okay. She, she was at the AO. She got sent in and took over. Was it before Hannah or after Hannah? I can't remember. She she came in right at the beginning when they first opened it, and uh, and she she was my auditor at um, at the AO, and I I used to actually go on missions with her. Wow wasn't supposed to do because this before I was in the Sea Org, but she used to take me on these missions with her, which were some pretty intense missions. You know, a couple were very memorable, uh, in particular, the one with John McMasters. Um, the he, world's first clear. Yeah. When he was in deep, deep depression, really deep depression. What was your mission? Well, the whole mission was to to save him because he he wanted to leave Scientology. He was so depressed and and he said, I'm not clear and nobody's clear. Mm. And he said, clear is bullshit. Right. At least the way it is now. And nobody has really attained the state of clear. And he was quite, um, you know, he was uh, quite sure of that. And, you know, back then, I mean, it was thousands upon thousands of hours on the clearing course before you were able to attest. And, uh, you know, the, the mission was, he was very, very close to Yvonne because, you know, Yvonne was very, very close to Hubbard. Right. And, um, and she was a deep personal friend with John and she felt comfortable bringing me. Um, and we, we spent hours and hours with him. And he was just a wonderful man who got beat up and th thrown under the bus by Hubbard completely. Really right. Was. And if you look at Dianetics, I mean, Hubbard, L. Ron Hubbard, came out with uh, Dianetics in May 1950. And if you read that first edition, he makes all these claims. He's the first person ever to know how the human mind works. And he describes this idea of a reactive mind and engrams and that his solution, a kind of a talking cure, will solve these problems of the reactive mind and you will become clear. And this would have certain uh attributes like your iq would be raised uh 2020 vision just various things but a lot of vitality and i remember reading i've read that book cover to cover and one of the claims it makes is that you can achieve this state in as few as 20 hours so in 1950 the idea was you buy you pay five bucks for this book you find somebody else to pair up with you quiz each other about your uh prenatal memories 20 20 uh, hours later you're clear now we fast forward, and, and and initially in the 50s he supposedly did have a lot of clears but then at some point he decided no nobody's been clear and in 1966 16 years later he said this englishman named john mcmaster was the world's first clear and mcmaster was a very charismatic guy scientology would send him around the world to give speeches about it he was also gay and yeah. it was, and it's always been kind of interesting why Hubbard, who was so homophobic, would choose a gay ambassador basically for Scientology at that time. But all it did was leave him totally depressed, like you're saying, and uh, you had to try and, and help him out of it. What happened to him ultimately? Well, he died. It wasn't that long after that that he died. Um, I, I can't remember how long, but it was not that long. Several, you know, maybe. 
four or five years. I'm just guessing though, because that was um, when I when I met him. That was 1969. Is when I met him, uh, and he was. He was just. He was a, a wonderful, sweet guy who had whose life had been turned upside down, and you know, I I don't know how it affects everybody differently, but uh, I don't think there's anybody that's not vulnerable vulnerable to being brainwashed by this you know pretty pretty horrific con man. Jeff, do you remember when you were declared uh, or, or certified clear or whatever it's called? Oh, well, it was a big deal for both Robbie and I at the time. Okay. And um, we had to go what's now they do it. Mostly people go clear by getting Dianetics. So you could actually do that in a mission or an org and then verify it. In those days, we had to do everything by the book. You did your um life things life repairs and the things that de dealt with your immediate life and then you had to go to power processing it was called where they asked a really key question and then you did the next one had to do with these words called r6ew and this was a pre uh the first the thing you did just prior to clear and you had to do solo auditing that's where you learn to solo audit and then you did solo auditing on the clearing course and you got a pack about that thick all handwritten and you had to follow very carefully and if you here's the thing if you didn't follow the what you were doing and you made errors then you were put in what's called the lower condition not like treason or enemy or something like that. And then you had to work your way, liability, and you had to work your way back. I think it was liability, but if it was really gross, then treason. Wow. Yeah. And that was, uh, we did the, <clears throat> we did a clearing course um, in 68, uh, which was, I, I think I was solo auditing about 50 hours a week, 60 hours a week. And I, and I think I was on the clearing course for maybe, I don't know, a month. I had two to 300 hours of auditing in for that. And I, I still have my, um, I still have my gold clear bracelet. So, so I went, I tested to clear October 10th of 1968 and my, they had clear numbers that they assigned and my clear number was 1,456. So, and then, uh, and I think Jeff was followed real close to that. Yeah, I was right after you. Yeah. right after you yeah wow and, um, so that would and that was those were pretty interesting days because the <clears throat> the advanced organization and an american saint hill organization they they came to los angeles i think it was around august of 68 is when they came maybe the end of august of 68 and as soon as they arrived we were there within a week when they arrived in los angeles because we came right off of our i love you tour our I love you tour or summer tour. And we went straight to Los Angeles. And the first, first thing Jeff and I did uh, was we did our power auditing, which didn't take that long. And then we did our our um, grade six, which is our 60 EW. Um, and that didn't take very long. And then we were on the clearing course. Wow. It sounds like it's all pretty fresh in your mind, that whole thing. Oh, I remember <laughs> it really clearly. Wow. There, and it was really wild times. And, and being in the course room, in the grade six course room, and the, the way people would attack each other. For and, bull baiting? And, and, well, do, no, this was just drama. They were just, oh. just dramatically crazy. Uh-huh. They're nutsy. And, and, no, no, Tony, you know, Tony, we're both clear and we have perfect memory. <laughs> That's right. Yes, we do. Why, why am I surprised that you remember this detail so well? You're, 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 you know, superior beings. That's right. Yeah. Yes, we are. <laughs> and, and also, Robbie, Robbie met his first wife, Snooky Weiss, at at, at the American Saint Hill organization. She was the top, the senior CS, correct, Robbie? Yeah, she was on the original class eight course. That Hubbard taught himself on on the Apollo, the very first class eight course. And Hubbard uh, Hubbard really liked her, and he sent her as the uh, CS, the case supervisor, 
to open up American St. Hill. Wow. In LA. Wow. And Jeff, uh, speaking of uh, uh, famous partners, you married a very well-known actress uh, while you were in Scientology. Diana Canova. Yeah. Who, who her mother was Judy Canova, who was really big in the 40s and early 50s as a comedian, Judy Canova. And I met uh, Diana through another Scientologist, but Diana was not a Scientologist. And, and this was a masseuse friend of mine named Rochelle Linker. And so I met Diana at the a and Studios. And she was, in, she was an LA City College graduate of, of theater. And so I think I impressed her because she's coming over to A&M Records, right? And we're recording an album with a guy named Jimmy Spheris. And, and I was taken by her, I mean, beautiful woman and um, wonderful singer and very talented actress. And then she became a super hit on Soap. On Soap, that's right, I remember that. The, the kind of, with Thomas Harris, which. Right. Oh gosh, you guys, uh, the, the era of you've spanned is so fascinating from around the time, I mean, Yvonne and the early Celebrity Center, uh, the the rise of Miscavige, uh, and then both of you getting out. Looking back, what are what are you both? I mean, it's great that you remember all those processes you went through in Scientology, but when, now when you look back, what is your overall thought about this organization? You want to go? Or you want me to go? Go, Robbie. I always have something to say. I kind of, um, <clears throat> as an experience, as a as a growth experience, um, I, I mean, I wouldn't say that I would get back into Scientology if I had to do it again, but that's because I know what I know now. The experience of being in the cult and going through the training and going through the auditing uh, is probably one of the most valuable experiences of my life. Really? Yeah. Um, you know, it's a con, it's a cult, it's dangerous, it obviously breaks families up. It's a horrible thing, but I think those those kinds of experiences are what you build your life on. Mm. I mean, it, you, know, you know, if you're just totally successful and everything's going great, I'm not sure how much that contributes to, to your growth as a spiritual being. I think that the bad things that happen to you, it, it's, it's not it's it's not that they're bad it's how you look at them and if you treat them as bad then maybe they'll be bad but if you go through an experience like scientology it can be a good experience what about you jeff well 46 years and and i wasn't i wasn't making the kind of money that robbie was making i was doing well uh, my retirement over a million dollars is now residing in the billion billions of dollars that Miscavige lords over. Right. But um, if I, I I needed a family, that was just me. I think the right way to do it for me would have been if I had been able to recognize very quickly what value there was, and then just moved on because it was. I know there are many dreams I had that. I did not achieve because of being in that group and dedic dedicating literally thousands of, of performance hours to Scientology, not to mention the other creative things I did. So uh, I wouldn't, uh, and I did get two or th three valuable things, but I believe you can get them. There's so many good things out there now and so many good philosophers and spiritual writers. And I would not, it is who I am. So do I regret it? No. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I don't think I would be so positive about it if I had been in as long as Jeff. You know, I'm I'm going by the old the old saying that there are no bad experiences, just experiences. But Scientology being considered a bad experience, I turned it into a good experience just because 
uh, of the way that I look at the world and the way that I look at things, but it's a, it's, there's no question it's a very bad, dangerous organization. Well, you both made it out. Somebody that didn't make it out that was very close to you, Jeff, was Jeffrey Lewis. Uh, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful character actor. I love the movies he's in. He's so expressive, so good. Juliet Lewis's father. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the things that you know, he didn't do that he might have that might keep it might he might still be around today? Well, yeah, I want to talk a little about that and then get back to our movie, but uh, um, but because I want people to know where they can see it. No, live. We'll, we'll we'll get there. We'll get back to that in just a yeah, second. Yeah, but but I Jeffrey had like a tiny amount of close friends, tiny. He mm. kept his distance from everyone. And all I can say is that it didn't help his growth. What it did is it reinforced his self-centered kind of almost narcissism and, and allowed him to be treated like a big, like a king or a prince in Scientology. Mm. And he could, but he could ignore like human relationships. And so, and I think that's very normal that that's what they want. They want you to be self-centered, to go for your immortality and whatever it takes for you to do that. Right. There's only one path and that's Scientology. So, so, and I love Jeffrey and we, we created a body of work called Celestial Navigations. He was such a wonderful storyteller writer and storyteller and we have all of those albums that we did and people became tremendous fans of the group because because and jeffrey's was such a brilliant actor right yeah i, I think i was one of celestial navigation still am one of their biggest fans i i probably listened to every album a couple of dozen times and it was it was remarkable just the most remarkable entertainment that I've ever heard in my life. If you haven't listened to Celestial Navigation's work, it's it's uncomparable. There's nothing that's ever been done like it. And uh, the music was incredible, and the you know the stories were just amazing. People well, it's uh, it's just sad that Jeffrey Lewis didn't also get out like the two of you. But uh, we do remember the great work that he's done. I'm glad that you mentioned that, Robbie. That it's really good work. Yeah. All right, so let's make sure people know where they can get to see this documentary, Brothers Broken, about this whole journey that two of you went on. I've seen multiple versions of it. It's gotten better and better. The storytelling is very tight now. I think you guys have a really unique story. It's not just another Scientology escape story. No, this is there is some really great stuff about Scientology, about you guys, about the new music wonderful now jeff let's get it right where can people yeah. see this movie okay in at the cinequest film festival they can see it on the 20th august 20th august 20th and that's at 4 30 4 30 p.m and, and, and that's downtown at the hammer theater it's a huge beautiful old theater in downtown san jose okay and then on the 26th at 11.30 a.m. AM, they can see it at the Icon. It's it's more than that, but if you just look up Icon Theater in Mountain View, they can see it there, and it's a very nice area, beautiful theater. And here's the cool part. We just got into the Studio City Film Festival. All right. So we're going to be at the Lemley Theater on September 3rd, at 7 30 it's a good sized theater and that's los angeles so that's great wow we can bring everyone out and we're going to yes. be going out we're going to go out to the orgs and pass out cards and flyers to them so they can come i, I would love for them to come down and, and to, to question well know, this is definitely up. an underground bunker uh event i'm gonna i'm gonna want photos from you guys maybe Absolutely. some shoot some video with your fans if, if Scientology tries to disrupt anything, I want to know about that. 
I only wish I could go. I won't be able to, I won't be at no, either, no, either San Jose or LA, but uh, boy, I want to hear all about this. I'm so happy for you guys. I know how tough this has been getting this all together. It's just not an easy thing making a movie, but no. uh, you guys have done a brilliant, brilliant job. And boy, I think you're going to have a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all your support, Tony. It's been. Yeah, absolutely. Part of this story. wouldn't be happening without Tony. That's well, hey, you doing. know, uh, I'm in the movie, so I got to give that disclaimer. But uh, I'll, I'll be looking for some, you know, critics criticism for about that. I'm sure I'll get. <laughs> I'm sure I'll get some. Oh, OK. Uh, yeah. Uh, so. All right, guys, thank you so much. I, you know, I, I love you both. And I've, I've had such a good time uh, with both of you. And I, I really am so excited that this is finally happening. And I can't wait to hear how well it goes. Okay. Thank you. And the love's going back to you for sure. We love everything you do. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you.